What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to Unit 3. This is our third unit. I think we're going to have 10 all together, maybe 9. Um, this is on the Industrial Revolution. This is a very monumental, hugely super important time period um, in history. There's a ton of changes that are going to go on. I put the dates up there, 1750 to 1900. Not that you need to know them or memorize them, but I just want to point out, it's good to keep this in perspective that this Industrial Revolution that we're going to talk about and go into a little bit today is running around, is happening, not running, happening at the same time as the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, Haitian American, Latin American revolutions. And they are running what we would call concurrently, meaning here's concurrently, they're running at the same time. They do intersect a little bit and they do influence one another just a little bit. But for the most part, they're separate, but they're going on at the same time. Whereas the Enlightenment, Haitian, uh, French American Revolution are more political changes in government. This is more social economic and a couple other things going on. So this first video that we're going to look at is on the causes of the Industrial Revolution or the historical context of the Industrial Revolution. Um, as I said before, and I will keep saying that is our big phrase and our word that we're going to see in a lot of the CRQs. Um, so we're looking today at the causes of the Industrial Revolution. And I know it sounds horribly boring. I don't know if you think this way, but when I was in high school, when I was in college, I heard the Industrial Revolution sounded awful, but there's a ton of um, good stuff that go on in this period that's actually very interesting, connects to a lot of things happening today. So here we go. What is Industrial Revolution? If you haven't learned this before, if you have no idea, my guess is that any of you watching this right now, no one that you know, maybe with the exception of one or two people, farm for a living, especially if they live in the United States. And But if you went back and, and I talked to people from the area that is now known as West Hampton Beach, and I went back to 1700, almost everybody farmed. And what this shift is in the Industrial Revolution is people, it's a shift from most people farming, so the majority of people being farmers. And we talked about, for example, like in the French Revolution, when it first started, 80% of people in France were farmers. They were peasants in that third estate. So most people are going to be living in the countryside, living in farm on farms, not living like we imagine today in a urban or a city or a suburban town. Back then it was, you lived on the farm, you worked on the farm, you probably died on the farm, um, and your kids took over the farm when you died. So this is a shift from people living on those and working on those farms to people becoming, to working in factories, to doing office work, where the majority of people no longer work in farms. This period, and I don't know if you remember this from last year, if you learned about this last year, but it is probably as important as the Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution was that shift from hunting and gathering to farming. And this is the next phase of this, which happens, I don't know, say 10, 10,000 years or 8,000 years later, 10,000 10, years later. Um, so it's the shift. And it's hugely important because you have to think if you're moving people off of farms and into cities, that you're going to see a whole bunch of things that are going to happen as a result. So... The first piece of this, and really what leads to a lot of this, is this what is called an agricultural revolution. So I know I'm throwing a lot of revolution terms at you. When you see revolution, it just means a big change. So for, in order for the industrial revolution to happen, you need people, and you need new. And in order to have people, you need food. So around the 1700s in Europe, and really especially in, in England and Great Britain, there were these new farming techniques were developed. And I don't want to go into the details of them because unless you are a huge farming fan, which I don't know if anyone is, um, it's probably not of interest to you, but there's a huge period where people learn a lot of new stuff about farming. Um, they learn how to rotate crops around so you don't ruin the soil. Um, they learn new fertilizing techniques for the crops. They learn better watering techniques for the crops. They also learn better use of animals and how to mate animals with each other to have bigger and stronger animals. And all this blah, 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 blah stuff that I'm talking to you about that you probably just zoned out on me on is new farming techniques. And when these new farming techniques happen, what's important about it is you're going to see an increase in production. And the fancy word here is agricultural, which is just better food production. And because we have more food, we have more babies. And there's two pieces of this. One, People with their tummies filled with food, people who are not starving, are more likely to have kids, okay? They're more likely to have children. And number two, children who are well-fed are more likely to live longer. And as a result of these two things, we have people having more kids and people who have more kids, those kids are going to live longer. And as an adult, you are going to live longer. And as a result of all this stuff, we're going to see an increase in population. So this agricultural revolution is the first key piece to the Industrial Revolution because you need people. Um, you need a growing population in order to industrialize your country in order to go from factory or from farming to factory work. So with that in mind, with this agricultural revolution piece hanging over our head right here, 
there are three causes of the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> First, it's going to start in Great Britain, also known as England, which I'll get to in a second. But if you are a leader of a country and your country is not industrialized and you want your country to industrialize, there's three things that you need. There's three like you have to have these three things. And if you don't, you're in trouble. Number one, you need people. And I just told you we have people now because we have an increase in population in the 1700s in England as a result of the agriculture revolution. You need that large population to some the people to farm, but a lot of people to work in factories and to build and make and do all the stuff that you can think of with industrialization, whether it's build railroads or smelt metal or whatever it is, build shirt or make shirts, whatever. So you need that large population. The second thing you need is you need natural resources. You need things to build and to fuel the factories. So in this case, you need timber or trees to build factories, to make those factories out of wood. And also you need coal. Coal is what is used to power factories back then. So you need that coal. And when that coal heats up, um, it can power, it'll eventually, with inventions, it'll power machinery. And you need those two things. There's one other thing you need, but it's super important, and you need money. If your country is not wealthy enough, if you don't have money, you cannot build factories. You cannot pay people to mine these resources. So if there's enough money and there's investors willing to invest in chopping down trees and <clears throat> mining coal and uh, building these factories. If you don't have that, it can't happen. But luckily for Great Britain, they have the three things. They have people, they have natural resources, and they have the capital. Capital is just another word for money. Um, so if you ever see that term, capital is just to use money and to invest money to make that money back. Just one side note before I wrap up today, because these terms are going to get thrown around a lot and I'll, probably no one has ever explained this to you. This is my fancy map of Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland. These pieces are going to be interchangeable. These terms, I try and, I try and use the correct terms, but sometimes I mix them up and throw them around. <clears throat> if you ever hear the term Great Britain, Great Britain refers to Scotland, England, and Wales. The main center of power at this time is in England. So sometimes people throw around England and Great Britain to be interchangeable. But the correct terminology is Great Britain. Um, most of the industrialization is going to happen in England here. If you want to refer to the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom also includes North today, Northern Ireland right here. Okay, so Northern Ireland also includes the United Kingdom as well as Scotland, England, and Wales. We have Ireland here, which is split up today between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, the reason it's split up is most people in Northern Ireland are Protestant and most people who are in the Republic of Ireland are Catholic. And last but not least is the British Isles, which contains this island right here and this island right here. Just a quick little rundown of that stuff. I'm going to try and use Great Britain as much as possible, but if I accidentally throw in England, just so you know what I'm talking about, I rarely use the UK or United Kingdom. No offense to any of my UK fans out there. So that's what we got. We have the Industrial Revolution shift from farming to factory work. We have the Agriculture Revolution, which leads to an increase in food production. And then number three, we have the causes of the Industrial Revolution, which is this shift from farming to factory work, which is people, um, capital, and natural resources. That's what I got. Easy peasy. You got any questions, you know the deal. Write it down. Let me know. I'm out.